Okay, so welcome everyone to Search and Matching in Macro and Finance virtual seminar series. So today we're super happy to have Burton Hollowfield presenting volume and intermediation in corporate bond markets with Artem Nekrudov and Chester Spat, who are um, also here with us today. And we're also super happy to have a group of panelists, Bruno B.A., Hank Bestenbinder, Pierre Colleen Dufresne, Amy Edwards, Rigo Hay, Charles Jones, uh, Ricardo Lagos, Ben Lester, Dimitri Livdan, Guido Menzio, Gideon Sar, Norman Shroff, Chester Spat, um, Bruno Soltvanum, Vish Vishvanathan, Pierre Levy Weil, and Randy Wright. Okay, so a real quick reminder of the seminar format. The talk is gonna be one hour, followed by 15 minute Q&A. Uh, during the talk, you can post questions to the Q&A, and if it's an uh, important clarifying question, we'll in I'll interrupt Burton and, and ask him to address the question. Um, for other questions, we'll defer them to the Q&A segment and have the authors respond to that. Um, and also, as the talk is nearing, please post your questions to the Q&A or use the Zoom raise hand feature and then during the Q&A, we'll unmute you and have you ask the question directly, okay? And of course, like if, if we run out of time, we may not be able to get to all your questions, so we apologize in advance for that. All right, um, and last uh, housekeeping, um, in two weeks, we have Daryl Duffy presenting um, on Monday, July 13th, all right? So with that, um, I'll hand it over to Burton. Take it away, please. Okay, uh, thanks, Batch Meg. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting feedback. Um, uh, I admit I'm sort of overwhelmed by the number of panelists. So um, uh, anyway, thanks. I'm going to start with a poll before I go into the talk, just to set the tone. So let me see if I can get this to work. Does that, is that showing up? Yeah, we can see you. We can see the part. All right. seems to have stabilized. So I'm going to end the poll. So it appears that everybody thinks you need to know price and volume in OTC markets. Um, although there are um, some, some no's for both. Um, so uh, what this We'll see what people think at the end of the at the end of the talk. I guess is the way I want to say that. So I'm going to turn the poll off. Thank everybody for completing them. It just sort of sets the oh, so everybody sees the results. All right. So I'm going to share my screen. So can everybody see that okay? Yep. Okay. All right. So as Batchmik said, um, this is work with uh, Artem and Chester. And this is a paper we've been uh, working on for a while. Um, but it is the first time I've given it. And so I'm looking forward uh, to getting some feedback and um, getting some suggestions and so on. Um, it's it's basically a paper with some empirical facts. Um, and I'm gonna to try to tell you the story of these facts and just try to tell you what's going on. Um, so let's see if I can switch pages. All right, so um, the, at least 
one of the people who regulates in corporate bonds or who gathers information um, is FINRA. And so FINRA regulates the broker dealers, uh, writes and enforces rules, um, and uh, works with uh, different constituencies and is definitely interested in fostering transparency and providing education. And one of the um, things that I'm guessing everybody or most people here know about the corporate bond market and the fixed in income markets in general is over the last 20 years or so, they've moved from not being very transparent to increased transparency. More information has been available to participants, most notably through the trace, trace system. Um, but the market is not uh, fully transparent. Uh, it's not fully transparent um, because although uh, we uh, observe uh, prices, we don't observe everything about volume. So trace in corporate, in, in trace eligible bonds, there's partial transparency. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, for different types of corporate bonds or debt securities, you don't observe the entire transacted volume. So for example, for investment grade securities, um, you see the volume if it's 5 million and below, but if it's a larger volume that transacts, what's reported is 5 million plus. If it's an investment grade bond, or sorry, a non-investment grade bond, the cap is 1 million. So you see the small quantities, but if the par amount is more than 1 million, you don't, you don't observe that. Okay. The size eventually gets published. Um, what you do observe within 15 minutes of the transaction is you observe um, the, who the, not the names, but you observe if it's a dealer to dealer trade, if it's a customer to dealer trade and so on, you observe the price and you observe if, if there's a FINRA member as part of the transaction, okay? And so that, that's the information you actually see. And there's been a proposal with uh, FINRA to make some changes in the in the information that is released okay and the the um the proposal uh had a couple pieces to it one piece was to change these dissemination caps so that instead of for investment grades you see five million plus now you see 10 million plus. So it's increasing the volume information and a similar increase for high yield from 1 million to 5 million. So you see more volume information. The second part of the proposal actually was to delay the information that people observed about price. Instead of getting the price 15 minutes, it would be moved to 48 hours, okay? So there was kind of this idea to increase volume transparency and to reduce price transparency, okay? Um, and Burton, then the- Sorry to interrupt, but uh, I think it's important to note that this came out of the Fixed Income Market Structure Advisory Committee. Um, yeah. And uh, there were a whole, you know, bunch of people who, were, who weighed in on this. Um, and we're, all the all the yes votes were from practitioners, um, and all the no votes on this were from the acad the academics were unanimously unanimously opposed to this, um, and spoke loudly against these proposals. Yes, definitely, definitely. People put in comment letters on this, 
Um, one maybe interpretation is the practitioners wanted the price transparency for some reason and they were willing to give up some of the volume transparency. Well, obviously, um, this is what happened. Um, so so just, to, just to add one, one point to what Charles was, was pointing to. So when FINRA put it out for comment, actually most of the buy side weighed, weighed, in negative, weighed in negatively as well. It seemed that it was the, sell, the, the dealers and only the very largest buy side that were positive when, when FINRA actually reached out for comment. That's Thanks. right. That's useful, Chester. Yeah. I didn't That's know right. that. Um, and uh, recently the CFTC has uh, proposed a similar kind of um, change for the swaps market. Um, May I ask a clarification question for, uh, with Charles and Chester? Uh, when you say that some constituency were against uh, the proposal, they were against because they wanted even more transparency or less transparency? Uh, the, 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 pe the people who were opposed were supportive of, of price transparency and didn't want to delay the dissemination of prices by 48 hours. Um, yes. And that, that didn't manifest itself strongly within the SEC's advisory committee initially, except by the, acad except by the, key, the, the academics on the committee. Um, but it did manifest itself very strongly when FINRA reached out for comment. Um, and then most of the comment letters came in negatively because of concerns about the price, or about delaying price dissemination by 48 hours on the, on the large blocks. The buy side, except for the very largest buy side participants, were strongly opposed. Correct. Correct. Thank, thanks, Chester. Yeah, that's helpful. Okay, so um, there obviously was a debate. I'm just going to give you some of the quotes from the from the early proposal. Um, so these, uh, there's some positive ones here. There's some negative ones. Actually, um, the I would say the impression that I had is many of the dealers were worried about having more time to kind of transact the orders and to move the orders, worried about front running and so on. And I'm going to go to the next one. So there was a kind of an information question, okay? And what our paper is trying to do is to just try to bring some information on these questions. Um, and so we're just gonna, I'm just gonna for the next, I don't know how long I have, the next 45 minutes, just show you some facts about what's going on in the market and sort of get everybody to see maybe some of the issues. Um, so our paper is trying to at least start asking the question is do these caps matter? Do they matter for transaction costs? Do they matter for information flows? Do they matter? What kind of information is there on the intermediation in the market? And how do they work? And so we can start thinking about trying to answer these questions. What I'm not going to do is I'm not going to show you some kind of theory model to um, help discipline the questions, not because it's not important, but because we haven't figured out how to do that yet. Okay, so today's talk is just some facts and to show you what's going on with this to get people thinking about the problem. So, so Burton, if I can ask a question, uh, I mean, in, in looking at these comments, even though there's no theory, do you have any idea what was driving some of these agents? Was it the fact that if the, if the trade is disclosed, it would be front run, as you said? Uh, was it something else? Uh, do you have any idea of what was driving the different participants in the market? Well, I could tell you the cynical view that Rick would always tell me when we were working on munis is they're trying to predict whatever rents they can make from doing this. I'm not actually claiming that. 
I didn't say it, so I don't know. And so maybe I'll ask Chester who yep. might have a sense of this. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think the dealers, the deal, the deal, the dealers' view. Um, um, well, the dealers, I think, I agree with what Burton said that the deal that the dealers pr probably were trying to protect uh, their 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 rents. Um, the dealers would had made claims about front running. But one of the things that's been striking in the whole bond transparency debate over the last 20 years or so is that the arguments against transparency at a generic level um, have not have not um, highlighted evidence. Uh, and that's been a frustrating aspect. And that, that was a frustrating aspect even even when I was in the role of, of chief economist and the dealers would come in to complain about the moves that had already been made, the initial moves on transparency that had been made. Um, the flip side is the buy, I think much of the buy side has been very supportive of transparency um, because they want to kind of know where the markets are and what the prices are uh, for when they're trading and they, and they view, you know, and, and a lot of the issue also breaks out in terms of the largest players versus smaller trade players. The, the largest traders um, have some, uh, want to keep whatever informational advantages they have. Yeah. And if I could add to that, Chester, I, I would say that, you know, the dealers really want a chance to lay off their inventory. Um, so they're really thinking in terms of what I would call partial equilibrium, that they, that that's really what's animating them in all of this. And everybody, um, the people who are um, sort of opposed to these who want who want more transparency are really thinking more in terms of general equilibrium that this information would be better for the whole market if it if it were out widely. So that's the way I sort of think about it in the absence of a formal theory model. I, I, that's a I think that's a reasonable way of thinking about it. So. But, you know, what I'm just going to show you is what do these guys do? I mean, what evidence do we have? Uh, we're going to we're going to show since we do have some ways of thinking about variations in the caps because sometimes bonds change from investment grade to high yield. How do things change in capped versus uncapped regions? And I'll just try to give you some evidence to get people thinking about these issues. Okay, so. We, we don't find actually a lot of evidence that these caps matter too much, and that's by isolating things around the cap. Uh, when we look when th where things change, we do seem some, see some evidence that costs get more expensive once you move into the opaque region. So there's definitely some kind of um, dealer information of bargaining power going on. Again, it's We'll get to that and you can sort of see how it works. Okay, so I'm just gonna just, you know, show you a little bit about our data and show you how about how, how all this works. Okay, so here's some some data. So we have a regulatory regulatory trace. It's data that tells us masked versions of of the dealers. So we have codes for the dealers. We don't know the names. We, so we know when there's a customer buy or a customer sell. We know the actual volume. We know um, since we have these names, we can construct the kind of chains of transactions. We know the prices and we know the times of what's going on. What we don't really know is we don't know the names of all the, all the customers. We did some work looking at the merchant data, although we haven't done much with that. So we can't tell if it's the same customer splitting orders very well in our data. But we do know something about how the dealers are working in this market. Um, our data goes from 2002 to the beginning of 2019, uh, we, we received this data from FINRA. And this is just to kind of show you what's going on over this period. So this is just telling you uh, two things. It's telling you uh, in the yellowish line, it's telling you at the monthly level, how many bonds are trading. Um, and so you see 
um, it's, it's roughly flat over our sample. Um, it also tells you um, how many bonds are outstanding that we have in our data. And so it also gives you some sense of about what fraction of these bonds are really trading. Okay, so just, just some basic facts. Um, for the high yield, you can see there's a lot more bonds than have been trading. So one of the things that I always try to think about here is just, you know, a lot of these bonds don't trade very much. So they are fairly sparsely traded. Um, again, it only goes up to 2019. So I think some things may have changed. Okay, so that's just what's going on. To give you some, some information about maturity. Um, so there's two lines on here, both again for the investment grade and the high yield. These are taken from bonds that transact. And so the curve that gives you vintage tells you how long the bond, it, the, the bonds that trade tells you basically how old they are, essentially. The top one um, tells you how much time is left on the bond. So just to give you a sense, obviously there's a lot of variation in here, but these are medians. So, you know, the median bond is like, got six years to go, is like four or five years old kind of thing. So just so you know what, what our data looks like. Okay, I'm not kind of making any big points. Then we did start to look at how many of these how many trades there are of these bonds, just again, so you, you get a sense of the volume distributions, and we can start thinking about the caps. So this is a plot. So let me try to explain what I'm doing here. So it's sorted by something called peripheral versus central. Peripheral dealers are um, dealers who are less connected into the dealer network. Central dealers are the central dealers in the network. And central dealers are the top 25. Like in many of these kind of uh, studies, they seem to be persistent. Um, there's some change, but they do seem to be persistent. Um, these are the number of trades per month over the year. And all are all the bonds, so it's a cumulative plot. The orange are the five million and above. Okay, so in terms of number of trades, these are ones that are capped. So this combines high yield and investment grade. So those are the ones that are definitely capped. It's roughly flat. As we move up the plot, the size of the transaction is dropping in terms of par. And so you're seeing there's more smaller trades showing up in both the peripheral dealers and the central dealers in the market. So if you were to think about a trend, there's been some more small trade in these markets. The number of trades that are capped is roughly constant over time. Okay, so some of the evolution in this market is more or less been uh, more smaller transactions. Okay, um, for reasons that I think many people in the audience know, it's not so obvious you would see a lot of splitting by the customers here because the transaction costs are much higher for the, for the small ones than for the big ones, at least if you were to think about transaction costs like spreads, okay? So I tend to interpret evidence like this to say that there's probably more smaller participants in the market or smaller or smaller trade yeah, participants, I think. Okay, so that's just more or less what's been going on in terms of the market. If you, so this, this says that same data, but maybe in a different kind of way. This is, if you look at the dealer's buys, 
uh, from customers. This splits it up between investment grade and high yield. The area is telling you how many of the trades come from peripheral versus central. What you should notice here is that the peripheral seem to be dealing more with the smaller transactions, at least as a proportion, and the central seem to be dealing with the bigger transactions. Doesn't mean the central guys don't do don't do um, both kinds of transactions, but they're they're probably a bigger part of the larger transactions. That's what this is telling you, and it's true in both investment grade bonds and high yield bonds. So there's some kind of, I'm not sure how strong you make this point, but there is some kind of sorting of who's, who's trading with who in this market. Okay. Um, hey Burton, I had a quick question. Uh, if you go back one slide, um, did you have a story in mind for the rise in smaller trades over time? Just, no, I don't really have a strong story for that. Um, Maybe more issuers, more small people have been wanting to buy bonds, but that, that's not really a very deep story, actually. Um, I mean, there's definitely been more participation in the bond market. Um, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that... Real quick audience question um, for Bu Tang. He says, in your first graph, I oh, just got answered, do your high yield include uh, non-rated bonds also? I include non-rated bonds. I believe it does. does. High yield include so, I, so I just responded to this question. So right, uh, basically FINRA classifies bonds based on Moody's and Standard Poor's. So those non-rated and also having disagreement between the two agencies would be all rated as uh, high yield in our grass. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Artem. <laughs> um, You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, that's why I'm glad Artem's here. He knows all the deep question answers. Um, again, just like, and I'm not, just to so you see what's going on and what these guys are doing. So what this plot does is it just tells you how long are the dealers holding the bonds. Um, and so this is sorted by central versus peripheral um investment grade versus high yield and so we construct this from our data it's a data for a period of time to actually figure this out you have to match the bond through its life right you see like flag x buys a bond flag x sells a bond it's the same par you can be pretty sure it's the same block of bonds moving around so there is a matching algorithm that's matching the dealer's trades using these codes. And since we have the timestamps, we now know how long they're held in the, in the dealer's inventory. And so let's look at this top plot so everybody can see how to interpret it. Um, this thing that says 15 minutes, so we're plotting by volume. These are larger volume smaller volume, okay, these are the central dealers. They're spending 40, more or less 40% of the time on the small ones, they're, they're cleared within 15 minutes according to our matching algorithm. Roughly 20% of the time, the large ones are cleared within 15 minutes. So they're holding the large ones longer, I think is the way you want to think about that. And then this just slowly increases the time from 15 minutes to one day to seven plus days. Okay. And so here we're looking at central versus peripheral. And you can see these things are, uh, Yeah, that's a good question. So I'm not gonna answer. Uh, we're looking at same thing in high yield, okay? 
So there's two points that I take from this plot that I think are useful. The first one is there's an awful lot of these transactions where they're not holding these things for very long, right? This 15 minute thing. Secondly, the, there's a difference between what the um, central guys and the peripheral guys are doing, okay? The central uh, ones tend to be holding it a little bit longer, okay? So that's the two points you should see from that, okay? So there's some intermediation services being provided because they're not all 15 minutes, but it's not like 90% of the transactions. Most of the time it's pretty quick actually, okay? Just also to get a sense of what everybody's doing, we tried to uh, look to see how they split. So we have an algorithm to look at the splits, either you buy from a customer and then you split. Most of the time in all these bins, there's not a lot of splitting. So I buy a block of 5 million, I sell a block of 5 million, okay? There's some splitting, but it's not that much. So the, what really these, I think the dealers are doing is they buy the bond, they hold it for a few minutes, they sell the bond in the same block. Okay, they, they split a little bit. Sometimes it takes longer to split, but that's kind of what they're doing. You can also ask, again, just so you kind of have a sense of what volume is doing to this, you can also ask when a dealer buys a bond from a customer, what are they likely to do with it? Are they likely to trade with other dealers? Are they likely to find another customer? And, you know, for larger, so again, the bottom line are customers only. So I'm a dealer, I buy the bond, I don't sell to other dealers, I sell to another customer. More or less, the bigger the volume, it shows up in all of these plots, the bigger the volume that you're buying, the more likely you are to basically sell it to a customer. Okay, so the dealers trading the big, big quantities, ah, thanks Batchman, the dealers that are selling the big quantities, they buy a big quantity, then they sell it to another customer. It seems like they don't sell it to other dealers unless they can't find a customer quickly, okay? And that's more prevalent in the larger sizes of these things. So that's in the cap zone, so to speak, actually. So this, I guess, speaks to some of Charles's maybe points earlier, okay? So again, just, just to tell you what's happening, okay? We're interested in what these caps do to transaction costs, what do these caps do to um, information flow. So again, uh, just nice to show you what's happening. These are plots of, for investment grade bonds, these are plots of customer spreads sorted by par value of the transaction. Okay, so the dots are the, the basically the data. Uh, we smooth the data so you can see the patterns. Couple things to notice here. The orange are the large quantities, the black are the small quantities. Okay, so as we move up, we're basically reducing par value. So this plot, if you think about like a point in time, but this plot is showing you that at a very gross level, bigger quantities are cheaper to transact. So kind of a well-known fact in this literature, but I, you can see it nicely here, okay? Hey, Burton, mm -hmm. uh, before you move on, could you just elaborate on how you're measuring the bid-ask spreads here? So these, these are from the matching algorithm, yeah, that's a good question. From the matching algorithm, we're, we're computing the difference between the price the dealer bought it from and sell it to. So there is, obviously, 
if it takes 20 days, there could be some valuation change going on in the asset. So there could be some bias. Um, and so they're different for the different holding periods, but it's, it's, really, it's really simply just the difference between the buy and the sell price from the matching. Yeah, so it's very simple. It's, it, 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 it's like the cash flow from the dealer. Okay, and so you, again, you see it. it it's, not, it's not constant. It looks like for the smaller quantities, it's been getting cheaper. It's a little bit flatter for the big quantities. There's a price difference between central and peripheral dealers, maybe a little bit bigger for the small quantities than the large quantities. Just sort of telling you what's going on here. Um, I think we were puzzled why there is this in 09 jump. We think it might have to do with um, the Dodd-Frank, but we don't have a very good explanation for that. So that's, that's more or less what's going on in the investment grade. Now this is just simplistic. To drill down on this, we just, we did some regressions. I guess that's what you're supposed to do. So we did some regressions to try to understand what's going on. It gives you some magnitudes and it also, we can start to see some caps analysis in here. Okay, so these are regressions from those data where we're gonna regress within the quantity bin, the spread on um, the volume, a dummy for whether you're dealing with a central dealer, the realized holding period. So that's, Amy, this is why we can use the holding period because we, we have the time. Uh, something we call prearranged dummy. That's a dummy for whether it happens within 15 minutes. So we would, we tend, I would view those as transactions where there might've been some um, discussion beforehand. So it's kind of like a prearranged trade and uh, whether it's a, a transaction with a customer. Yeah, it, I, I see Bruno made a point. Yes, it's definitely jointly endogenous. I'm not causing, saying anything more complicated than this just characterizes the data, okay? What you, what you see here, so these variables have all been demeaned. So what you see is this volume discount, right? Small quantities relative to the large quantities are more expensive. Same point I said before. This is the volume within the bin. You see a volume discount, except for the very large, the very large bin, okay? Uh, there is some difference in whether if you manage to trade with a central dealer seems to help you if you're if you're larger seems to hurt you if you're smaller okay real quick Burton um, this is all so this there's a question from both question slash comment from both Bruno and Charles Jones to you, regarding your previous plot so there's all this discussion that liquidity uh, regarding your previous plot, so the, you know we've been hearing all this discussion that liquidity has declined in the corporate bond market um, since the 2008 crisis, but it looks like you, on your graph that hasn't happened. Could you say something about that? I agree. It doesn't look, if you look at the transaction cost, that it's happened. Now, this is maybe related to Bruno's point. These are only conditional on having the transaction. So what we don't know is are there unmet transactions because we don't know we don't know how to measure those so i think you would need to actually have some kind of model to to answer that question but it, if you just look at raw transaction costs it definitely doesn't look like it's getting worse so yes um it does not say that it's getting more expensive yeah so you know same thing with high yield it's also dropping. You also see the same uh, jump at, at the implementation of Dodd-Frank. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the regression. I'm just gonna say similar kinds of patterns, okay? Now, one thing that's different 
is the high yield have a different cap? So the cutoff is going to be important. Okay, so we're interested in understanding the caps. So we wanted to see if we could find some evidence of the caps mattering in transaction costs. And I'm just going to show you a, a gross picture, which basically makes the point they don't seem to be doing at a first cut, they don't seem to be doing too much. And so this is a this is a plot. It's a plot where we took the transactions, all right? So we took the transactions and we looked at the transactions that are slightly below the cap relative to the transactions that are slightly above the cap. So 10% around the caps, okay? And so there's two just uh, basically uh, non-parametric distributions of the spreads, like the realized transaction costs. The left is for investment grade, the right is for high yield. They don't look so different, actually. So if you were to look to see, is there some kind of discrete jump in prices when you cross this cap? It doesn't really look much like it to me. Okay, um, we can look at the averages as well. It doesn't look so different. Our first idea for looking on this was to try to do some kind of regression discontinuity around the cap, but there doesn't seem to be much of a discontinuity to do a regression discontinuity around is the way I would say it. So Burton, so what hmm. about the volume around the cap? Is there gaming around the cap? No. Nope. It does not look like that. Now there is there is some kind of there is some kind of clustering, but the clustering is actually not the cap. It's round numbers. Actually, so yeah, we also looked at the volume distribution, and you definitely see jumps at one million, two million, three million, four million, five million, but the cap one is not really any different than any of the other round number effects. So it doesn't look like people are strategically like trying to get above the cap or strategically trying to get below the cap. That was the, I was gonna say that next. That was the other reason why we decided not to go down the regression discontinuity route actually, because it doesn't seem to be much of a regression discontinuity. Now, um, we try, you know, we kept thinking we must be making a mistake, we're missing something here, but it just doesn't seem to show up empirically in the data. Okay, so that's one piece of evidence that the volume, the, the dissemination cap doesn't seem to be necessarily so important in the quantity. But you got to remember, I think everybody, just to remind everybody, you do see the price in the cap. Uh, at some point, we thought, well, maybe you could see Hi, from Pierre. Pierre. Hey, I'm, I'm, it's Pierre here. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm kind of curious whether you looked at whether this is different for different types of clients. Like, can you sort of see if you have some identify clients that are, you know, better or larger or that make money more often than others? And would these guys be more inclined to strategically push into large trades as opposed to small retail clients that you know maybe? So we have. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. We don't, what, we could figure out clients from the merchant data uh, and try to match. Unfortunately, our data doesn't give you like all the hedge funds and other kinds of clients. We could look at insurance companies. And, but can you look at their performance maybe? Their trading performance is, yeah. so just to see those that tend to be, you know, persistently better? Yeah, we could. We could look at that. That's a good idea. We haven't done that. Uh, that's very so, nice. So uh, may I just step in briefly? So one problem with our data is that our data doesn't differentiate different clients. So like all clients are kind of representative client in our data. We could link it with a uh, make so that we can separate out insurance companies and see how they differ. Uh, but um, we actually, we try to approach this indirectly by looking, for example, whether um, some transactions, they go through a longer intermediation chain than the other transactions. And yeah. because if you are like a front runner, you would need some chain to be happening because if everything happens in, uh, simultaneously, like the buy and sell, like a prearranged uh, risk principle transaction, there is nothing to front run. 
So that's that's the indirect approach we're planning to take. Yeah, thank you, Artem. So we also, so the other thing you could ask is, or that we asked was, if you look, is there any evidence that there's different information in trades below and above the cap? Okay, so the idea is if you look at a transaction that's above the cap, maybe it conveys information about free future returns of the, of the bond. And so knowing that it's above the cap could give you some kind of difference, differential um, long horizon predictions, which is a little bit related to Pierre's question. Um, so we followed kind of the standard approach and used a vector autoregression to look for price impacts around the cap and to see like the, the cumulative price impacts. So um, we looked at bonds that were consistently trading around the cap. And so there's something like three, 320 such bonds. Uh, 85 investment grade, 233 high yield. And we ran a VAR with those. And the variables we had were like the trade direction. So that would be the proxy for the for a trade. A dummy for whether you were below and above the cap. So we're gonna see if that has any extra information. Because, because of Vish's question about um, that we see a big effect for being on around around numbers. We included a, a a trade dummy for being a round number. We looked to see whether you were um, a central or a peripheral dealer, and then to to deal with valuation, we also included treasury returns. So what we did is we asked if you knew it was above the cap, is there different information in the in the trade? Okay, and so this is a kind of a standard approach. And I just, first of all, I want to convince you that there's definitely some kind of price impact. So this is the impulse response on the trade direction. So plus is a buy, minus is a sell. And so I think this thing works. This is investment grade versus high yield. These are percentage of total variance. So you see a big initial impact. That's basically the bid ask spread going on. Then it drops and flattens out after about five transactions. So there's definitely some information coming out. Similarly with the high yields. Okay, so something is being released. Now this is this doesn't include the cap dummy, so it doesn't tell you whether you're getting any extra information from the cap or not. So to ask if the capped, if the trades that are capped have any extra information in them, what we did is we're going to look at the dummy variable for cap, which is the additive effect of that. Okay. And I should say this, this is from a VAR. All these VARs are sensitive to the ordering of the variables, so we tried a few couple different orderings and the results seem to be robust to that. Okay, and so this is the plot where we have a dummy that says, are you up to 10% above the cap? So a little bit above or a little bit below. Okay, good on time. All right, and so the blue is 10% below the cap. The red is 10% above the cap, okay? If there was in any ex extra information in the trades above versus below the cap, you'd expect to see these impulse responses being different, but in fact, they're both very similar. Okay, there's a lot of lines on here. The dark lines are the impulse responses. The, uh, the lighter lines are the one standard deviation confidence band. So what this is telling you, or how I would interpret this, is saying there doesn't seem to be any extra information of things going above and beyond the cap in terms of information flow, okay? Investment grade, high yield, same story. 
So what we think this means is there's no obvious new information from above, from above or below the cap in terms of information flow. Now again, this is, you know, we have a lot of data here. We're only looking at a few bonds. There's clearly some selection of bonds that we've used because they're ones trading around the cap. So maybe if you added more variables, then we could find something stronger, but it doesn't seem like you're seeing very much. Okay. So then the other obvious place to look for an effect of a cap is to try to find bonds whose cap changes. And the thing that you could look at to find bonds whose cap changes is bonds who downgrade. So remember, investment grade bonds have a larger cap. High yield bonds have a lower cap. So if a bond goes from investment grade to high yield, transactions that used to be capped are now visible to everybody. Okay, so what we did is we tried to look at, or we not tried, we looked at bonds whose ratings downgraded over our data. This tells you how many downgrades we have in this, in this sample. Um, it's about 1,800. To be included in the analysis, we need some trades. So they need to have at least 10 trades around the change. And we looked over a window of a year before and, out, and after, basically, okay? You'll notice there's a little line in kind of a, a lighter color below. The bar is the number of bonds. The little downward bar is the number of companies. So you can see there's lots of companies whose multiple bound bonds are downgrading over the same year. So it's not like these are independent variables is what I'm trying to say. Okay, so there's a lot of commonality in these things. Curtin, uh, uh -huh. my concern about this is that when things get downgraded, they, they completely change the way they trade. So it's gonna go from the investment grade desk to the junk desk mm -hmm. and uh, um, capital requirements are gonna be different for a lot of the players here. So mm -hmm. um, I'm a little worried about whether you can hold everything else constant here in this kind of analysis. So I agree with you about that. Um, I would say that this shows up. So we, we, did a, we did difference in difference regressions and we've been struggling to figure out what the right control groups are, which I think is another way of saying your point. So we've tried a couple actually. And so we looked at the bonds relative to themselves, more or less. We also looked at bonds that were already high grade as another comparison group. And any suggestions you have for what other kind of comparison groups we could do to make it a more credible argument, I'm all ears because, <laughs> yeah, I agree, I agree with the issue. So I'll show you what happens with a couple control groups and you can sort of maybe react to whether this makes sense. Yeah. To totally fair. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so just again, uh, so you see what's going on. These are the prices of these bonds. Um, time zero is the date at which they downgrade. So these is you're trading with a peripheral dealer versus a central dealer. These are sorted by par. Again, you're you're basically seeing it's more expensive because these are transactions um, for the smaller pars versus the larger parts. So there's again, the kind of a volume effect here. Um, these are all investment grade bonds before they change. So the orange are the capped ones here, okay? At least before the change, then after the change, the orange and the pink are the capped ones right, because you've now moved to a different bin, okay. The dealer holding periods, um, it's not, these are medians, there's quite a lot of dispersion in those numbers. Um, you see the peripheral guys aren't holding very long, the central guys are doing some intermediation. Doesn't seem like there's an obvious pattern except largers get more intermediation. 
So here are the transaction costs. Before the change. This is the point I was making earlier, capped versus uncapped. Don't look so different, so different. Afterwards, there's a bit of a jump. Okay. So we try to use that to do a difference in difference. Standard thing, obviously it's important to include bond and time fixed effects so we can look at relative to the time trends and relative to the bond zone history. We did two control groups. One control group or just look at trades that are now newly newly uh, hidden versus everything else. And then we looked looked at the other ones. Couple couple things to notice here. So once you include fixed effects, the transaction costs go up by about four basis points of the things that are now newly capped. Okay. The spread across everything is about 21 basis points. So it's more or less on the order of a quarter of a average spread has gone up. The transaction costs are rising when you get to be capped. Okay, that's that's what you'll notice. This is the volume distributions. This is Vish's question earlier. Doesn't seem to change much. So getting capped seems to cost you a little bit in transaction costs. Now, of course, the bonds are all different. So to deal, I'll just show you the table. To deal with this, we compared, made a control group of high yield bonds. So we were trying to compare apples to apples in this comparison. Same two things to notice here. Once you go from not high yield to high yield, the transaction costs go up relative to other high yield bonds. That's what this 0.434 is. Same kind of order of magnitude but there's another effect. The things that were capped before and still capped also go up to high yield bonds. And I think that, again, is speaking to Charles's point about the control groups, or it's speaking that there's some kind of equilibrium change happening to these bonds, okay? So I have three minutes left, exactly the right time to call it a day. The point of this paper is at least to get people start thinking about what these caps to do and to look at the places you can find them. It looks like we don't have a lot of evidence that if traders can kind of decide on caps that either there's any investment, or any kind of reason to want to go a little bit below or a little bit above in the data. It doesn't look like the information flow of cap trades are so different than the information flow of uncapped trades, but we have at least some trace of evidence that being capped increases transaction costs in that bin. Okay, and so I think it means that transparency matters for volume. It matters probably for the dealer's ability to bargain with the, with the traders around those bins. So that's the three points I wanted everybody to take out of this. And then the last one I've said a couple times, I don't think we have a good benchmark for what should be happening here. Our results are sort of looking within an equilibrium and changing. You might argue changing the bond quality is, is getting to some equilibrium effect, but I'm not particularly convinced. Okay, so if you take from this thing from our paper that caps seem to matter for dealer bargaining power, probably that's the thing to take from our talk. And I have one minute left, and I'm gonna just thank everybody for coming and say I'm happy to take questions now. Um, and 
Um, I thank everybody for, for your comments. Actually, so I'll stop talking. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Burton. So um, attendees, please feel free to raise your hands. Okay, so we have actually one. Um, Vish, go ahead if you wanna ask a question. Oh, wait. I'm just on mute. I got on mute. Okay. okay. So, so I guess there's one question which I think was was mentioned by I think R10, which is, did you look at how long it takes to lay off? Is it the case that capping has some value in terms of the time you get to lay off or something of the sort? Uh, oh. uh, I mean, not so much in the immediate impact. Uh, I know you had some graphs on this, but is there a way to quantify it further in some way? Because you're not seeing very much, as you said, uh, beyond the price impact, uh, the, the five, four or five basis points when you see the downgrade. Uh, are we missing something about lay, how long it takes to lay, uh, lay off? So uh, I May think- I respond to this? Yeah, of course. Uh, of course. Sorry. Uh, so, um, yes, Vish, thank you. So uh, we have this matching algorithm, which is actually pretty powerful because in some cases we can get pretty reliable histories of what happens to a transaction once it comes. So when a client sells something, we can really track where it goes, whether it's split in 10 pieces, etc. And for these cases, which roughly 60% of all this trading, 40% gets complicated because too much of activity. But for, those, for these other cases, uh, we know exactly, even if it took 100 days to really lay the whole thing off to somebody else, mm -hmm. all right? And uh, for example, in our spread evidence, we uh, limit, we only consider observations up to 30 days because then it, uh, there's a lot of valuation change. But uh, we've checked, uh, we didn't show this picture, but we've checked basically histograms like, uh, like the ones for the BDASC spreads for these holding periods that we estimate. And we didn't see neither. I mean, if, if, if we saw like a uh, discontinuity there, we would have uh, pursued that direction. But basically uh, yeah. the basic uh, variables under us, the basic suspects for us were the spread, the holding period, um, the kind of changes within the volume bins, the volume distributions, and uh, there we didn't find. So I, I think the answer to your question would be that the holding periods would be at least overall an aggregate, very similar. But uh, maybe as a, uh, uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre Colin Dufresne uh, suggested that some special cases, maybe some special uh, clients or some special banks for whom this matters much more. So our task is to identify these cases. On aggregate, we don't see them. So if you plot an aggregate histogram, you don't see them because these cases are like 1% of 5%. So on aggregate, it's not seen, but in some special cases, that's what we're pursuing now. Yeah. Hey, can I ask a question here? Randy Wright? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Is it my turn? I don't have a hand raising option here, so I just unmuted myself. Go ahead, okay. Randy. Hi, I'll assume it's my turn. So I want to bring to bear some search and bargaining uh, considerations here, because that's what the workshop's based around. Sometimes a bid ask spread is interpreted as transactions cost, but it could equally be interpreted as uh, bargaining outcome, the share of the surplus going to the, the dealer site. Mm -hmm. If you put caps on quantity, that could distort the bargaining outcome, or let's say affect the bargaining outcome in such a way that the surplus to one side goes up. And uh, mm -hmm. I think it'd be interesting from a theoretical point of view to think about putting caps in these markets and seeing how that changes in terms of trade. So the best known example for monetary economics, the buyer often wants to bring less cash that constrains how much he can purchase. So he's gonna get a lower quantity, but the terms of trade turn in his favor and his net payoff or surplus goes up. It'd be really interesting to try to look at this data through the lens of that search and bargaining approach. That's it. So that's a helpful question. Um, I'm gonna ask you a question. Since the cap is about the information that everybody else in the market sees, how do you see that would play out in the model? I, I don't have a, good way to think about that right now. I'm just saying any kind of, you know, imposition of trading restrictions or changes in information in principle could affect the, the surplus going to both parties. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's very helpful. 
Burton, I just want to just one question comment. It's related to Artem's point, which is I think I think you said that in this market, there's a sort of size discount, right? Larger trades get slow, smaller spreads on average, right? So I think that that doesn't square well with the idea that you would expect a higher, uh, you know, informational contact of the of all the caps trades, since on average larger trades get lower spreads. And so it seems like, related to Artem's point, maybe you need to to look for another dimension, right? There's this. I think one one reason we think that smaller trades get larger spread is that there's a whole bunch of retail kind of less sophisticated investors. And mm -hmm. probably you, you have a you have you have so you, I think you want to sort of double sort if you could on sophisticated investors, unsophisticated investors, large and small, and you would be looking to find some impact on those informational content and the lack cap trades among sophisticated traders, and that may be a you know hard thing to do, but it seems like this is what this suggests, right? Yes, I, I that, that's a good idea. I, 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 um... How to implement it doesn't seem so obvious to me, but if we but if we can maybe use the NAIC data to perhaps look at the different insurance companies, we could take some stab at doing that. So I, I agree with the point. Actually, it's a it's a good one. If you if you had some way to sort on the identity of the traders, then you could try to look at those that are repeatedly trading in the right direction. That'd be one way to to try to uh, isolate. The guys that tend to be on the right side of the trade and hopefully find they get charged higher spreads. I mean, I know it's hard to do if you don't have an identity of the trade. Yeah. We need some more. We need some more data. <laughs> yes. Maybe we have a policy proposal for you know regulators, which is to let them let us see customer identities or not identities but mask identities. So maybe yeah. Amy can say something about that. <laughs> uh, or maybe Amy can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I, I did have a question though. Um, it, actually, uh, this uh, bargaining idea on you know the surplus going to each each side of the trade. I think one way of thinking about this too, and, and building more onto this, is that we're not really talking about two parties in a trade here. We're talking about three. We have the original investor. You've got the dealer in the middle, and then you've got another investor. I wonder if you could try to see if there's any asymmetry differences between the um, the cost of the original investor and the, the investor that gets the offset. Because um, I, yeah. I think just intuitively, you would think that the loser would be the, the, the customer on the offset side. Yeah. Um, so yeah. generally, what we've seen on this dimension is that it's really, um, whenever these bonds hit the market, uh, this typically happens at worse terms. So dealers like to get rid of the bonds. Dealers don't like to take the bonds. So it's the guy who is, so the first client who is selling, he would probably get a discount, while the last guy who is buying, he would typically get a good price because he's getting rid of the bonds from this universe. Uh, but things change when it goes through the interdealer market because whenever it goes through the interdealer market, then the dealer centrality dimensions kick in. And, um, uh, but basically, yeah, but there's clear discontinuity in this, uh, the, uh, this asymmetry between the, the person who is kind of, who is, who is, uh, feel, who, um, who is putting the bonds versus getting rid of the bonds. So I think that would be what we'll see. Yeah, so we could look at that ratio below the cap versus above the cap, for example. Is a That's a nice idea. Um, I don't know if there's enough variation, but you, we could definitely try to look at that. So thank, thank you, that's helpful. So I, I have a question, good. So did you guys uh, take a look at what happened with the quantity discount before and then above and below the cap. So I was thinking that if there's less information above the cap, so the discount that you get by buying more, it's kind of not that, doesn't change as much as if you were below the cap. Does that, that does it make sense? We did, we did look at the slope at some point. I don't remember uh, the results. Remember the results, Artem? I just... Um, so somehow with the volume discount, what happens is that it really flattens out as we get to these capped volumes because uh, w already when you're past 1 million, the spread goes 
significantly down to numbers like 15 basis point, 20 basis point numbers uh, as compared to 150 basis points for the retail sizes. And over there, so for example, if we look these kind of 1 million, 5 million going forward, sometimes we even see the opposite. So some of Burton's tables today, it actually showed that spreads start uh, increasing as the volume increases within the bin. So, but it's good. I mean, yeah, so somehow uh, I think our difference in difference data behind our difference in difference when the bond changes the rating may actually speak to the change in the slope of the volume discount after, let's say, the cap changes because of the downgrade. We haven't focused on this explicitly, but this would be a good direction. So thank you. Okay, so next is Sheng Xing, if you want to unmute yourself. Uh, I'm wondering if the, say, this cap might affect dealers holding inventory holding, because if, you know, there's a cap, maybe the trade takes longer to be executed and then maybe dealers might be holding more inventory. So we could, we could definitely control for inventory, for inventory before and above the cap. We do have some evidence on the, the holding periods below and above the cap. And then we not look at the holding periods right, right around the cap, Artem? Again, yeah, so the holding, uh, yeah, so, the, so this is, yeah, so their evidence, the, their holding period, so how long, so like the half uh, period, inventory period would be the natural suspect for us to look for discontinuity and we didn't find surprisingly to us. So, so we were surprised not to find difference in like say how long it takes to get the bond and then get rid of the bond. Um, we do, we couldn't really track the inventory levels of different dealers because we don't know the kind of starting numbers. So, I mean, only indirectly we can get information about inventory levels and say whether, you know, cap somehow affects not the uh, holding period, but the level of inventory. And, but yeah, that would be, that would be maybe a possible direction kind of towards uh, this dealer heterogeneity idea in this context. Thank you. I'm writing this down. Good. Thank you. Along these lines, Burton, mm -hmm. I think it really gets to the heart of uh, Fish and Shen Sheng's point. And I also had this feeling that uh, perhaps you should look at it like a bad time, that kind of idea. If you okay. could, uh, bad time, like. Right? This, this way of if you disclose these uh, trade size above the cap and the somebody is squeezing you, especially bad, especially hurtful in those like, you know, volatile time, that kind of idea. On average, I wouldn't see anything like that, but exactly that they are getting the rent during yeah. the normal time to compensate the potential loss in the extremely, extremely you know, bad time. So that kind of a lo logic, I feel like these are the dealers are thinking. Yes, uh, we could we could actually plot uh, what's the probability of holding it longer and what the price discount you have to give to get rid of it above the cap versus below the cap to speak to that point, actually. And I, then I, to that. be honest, I never thought that the cap was going to have some information. It's always always feeling that they worry about it being squeezed, that kind of idea. So. Mm -hmm. I, it depends on player, obviously. So, um, yeah. But thanks for doing this work. It's, it's just, uh, yeah, I learned. Actually, part of the related, uh, I, uh, part of the related uh, motivation was that uh, sometimes even regulatory agencies, uh, they use CAP uh, as some kind of countermeasure. So, for example, they tell you, okay, we'll introduce this 48 hour delay, but on the other hand, we'll increase transparency by increasing the CAPs. And somehow arguing that at the end you would be like, uh, yeah, here you lost some, here you gained some, and then on average you shouldn't be against that proposal. But somehow part of our message is that you cannot really, like when you delay everything for 48 hours, including the price transparency, this is like incomparably much uh, stronger measure 
as compared to, let's say, moving the cap from 5 million to 10 million for investment grade bonds, because our analysis suggests that even at 5 million doesn't play any role, at 10 million it wouldn't play not a bigger role, kind of. So, but, but yes, I, it's maybe that we, we both are not in the same point. I think that on average, earning something for the loss in the worst time is actually a equivalent outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So but you're it's right. a good suggestion to look at the uh, kind of stressful times. This is because we kept plotting things on aggregate and partly that's why we didn't see much. So it's a good yeah. suggestion. Yeah, it is a good suggestion. That's something we can take out. Good, thank you. On the point, on the on the on the point on the point about um, the the, um, the 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 size and you know not seeing much evidence about that. I think it's also striking in all the commentary on the on the on the regulatory proposal that mo most of it really centered and the criticism of it really centered attention on the on the delay in price transparency and very little attention to the, si the, si the, si the, si the cap issue. And I think that's because basically it was sort of largely viewed by the buy side as almost irrelevant and that the key uh, to the proposal was delaying the price transparency for the 48 hours. And so all, all their attention was really focused on that and in a way kind of consistent with the evidence that we have on the, on the, on the size piece, on the cap piece. That's right. Okay, so you know we're happy to formally close the seminar. Thank you so much to Burton and Chester and Artem um, and all the panelists who've joined and all the attendees. And you know, uh, Zach, you feel free to pitch in. We're happy to keep the webinar open and let you guys continue discussing if you'd like. Um, but you know, we're gonna uh, end here formally. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks everyone. We'll stop recording now, but you're free to hang out and uh, continue talking about it. Okay.